Hey, photographers, welcome to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm here to help you build a sustainable photography business. That means improving your photo skills, building on your business knowledge, and honing your marketing abilities. But it also means helping you work more efficiently so you don't get burnt out in the long run. We do try to bring the show to you commercial free, so make sure to check out our sponsors, photographersedit.com and milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. Photographers Edit is custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu is the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing. Again, photographersedit.com and milu.com. All right, let's get into today's episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca Podcast episode. And I am here with a brand new guest and somebody I'm going to call my friend, Tony Black. Tony, thank you for hanging out with me today on the podcast. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, and, and it's really fun to to get a chance to to jump here on the call with you. The last time I think that we actually got a chance to connect in person was at the cookout conference back in October. So it's been a number of months ago, but yes. it, it it just feels, I don't know, it just feels like the other day after we get a chance to connect, you've got this really warm vibe about you, a great spirit about you, and it's great to connect in conversation like this again. Yes, same. Thank you. We totally didn't get to connect at WPPI. We just saw each other in passing. <laughs> yeah, I know. WPPI was kind of kind of crazy this year, and um, yes. I, I'm I'm hoping for more opportunity to, to connect with you and other photographers at smaller conferences in the coming months yes. and potentially even years. I think that's where it's really at. The cookout is a great example of a conference where you not only get education, but the community is just mind blowing. It feels like you're hanging out with family and um, Absolutely. I just I can't get enough of it. In fact, it's actually supposed to still be in Chattanooga this year, as long as the coronavirus doesn't take it out. Yes, That's going to be in my hometown. So I'm pretty excited to, to see everybody here. Yes, I'm excited. I've actually never been to Chattanooga. So it, it's an awesome town to hang out in. I, I think you're going to love it. And, and I'm looking forward to it. And we'll make sure to link to the conference in the show notes at bookapodcast.com for anybody who's curious. There are, there are very few conferences in the industry that I've been to where, again, that, that sense of family and community is so, so strong. And uh, this is one of them. And, and I just I, yes. I, I cannot recommend it enough for that reason. So um, make sure yes. that you check it out. We'll link to that information. Um, and actually, when Tony and I had the chance to chat at the cookout conference last, we were talking about the significance of vulnerability, which, you know, these days in our industry seems almost kind of cliche to talk about, but she had an interesting perspective on it. And I was like, hey, can we do a podcast about that? And uh, <laughs> she was kind enough to, to be willing to do so. So here we are. And we're going to get to that topic in just a little bit, Tony. But to begin with, one of my favorite questions that I ask almost all of our guests on the podcast has to do with brand position. Very simply, mm -hmm. the, the unique value proposition that your business offers to your marketplace. What is that for you? So for me, I am an intimate lifestyle photographer, and I really specialize in photographing Black people intimately. And so what that means to me is just being able to allow them to be their authentic selves so that I can capture that. Right. Which, I, first of all, it makes sense to have the conversation that we are today about vulnerability because you're you're able to set the tone for mm -hmm. your subjects to feel comfortable enough to be mm -hmm. vulnerable, to capture that intimate work. And for anybody who's curious, if you go to TonyBlackMagic.com, so T-O-N-I BlackMagic.com, that's Tony's website. You can see her work there. You can also go to Instagram, Tony Black Magic on Instagram. We'll link to both of those in the show notes. But as I'm just looking through some of these images on Instagram, I'm getting that sense of intimacy and ultimately vulnerability. Yes. And we're going to yes. talk more about how you encourage that from your subjects here in just a little bit. Uh, but thanks for starting us off with that. Let's talk about customer experience, which is very closely related. What's one of the most important principles that you've learned as a photography business owner about how to provide a better customer experience? Out of everything that I've done over, what, maybe 10 years of photography, I've learned that the number one thing is open and um, quick communication. Interesting. Okay, so open communication and quick yes. communication. Can you just briefly yes. describe what you mean by each of those? So as far as open communication goes, I feel like being able to, like having a grasp on setting the expectation. Mm. 
letting them know what's going to happen, what you expect of them, what they need to expect of you, and being able to respond in a very fast manner. And when I say respond quickly, I don't mean, you know, if you get an email at 11 o'clock in the evening, <laughs> I mean, at night, you have to respond. Okay. But definitely responding within 24 hours at the most. Because they're going to move on to someone else. Or if they're feeling unsure about anything, because, you know, people's minds start wondering if, you know, they're feeling unsure and they have more questions and they they ask you those questions and you don't respond quickly, they're going to start stressing out. <laughs> it's true. And, it's and then a, they're going to start stressing you out. <laughs> that's also true. Yeah, but I can totally relate. I mean, it's funny. I'll, it, it, it is very easy to kind of get stuck in our own head. And then we start to build yes. these ideas up. And, and we can do that even in the context of working with another company. And mm -hmm. so you're right. That, that responsiveness is really important. You'd think it would be mm -hmm. kind of a given in 2020 that people would be on top of communication because it's so easily accessible. We have a phone with us all the time. We can respond to an email, respond to a text message, respond to a DM. But it probably isn't the norm. And we have the ability to create a better experience by being more responsive, being, right. being more consistently responsive. So I think that's a great reminder. Um, so, yes. so the open communication managing expectations. I love the reminder for that too. And, and, and mm -hmm. I appreciate you kind of sharing your perspective on that. Let's talk about time. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I, I like that you, that you were suggesting a balance, even responding to clients that you know, it doesn't have to be at 11 o'clock at night, being a busy right. business owner, it can take up a lot of time and it's easy to get mm -hmm. sucked into that and then ultimately get burnt out. What's mm -hmm. a, a principle that you've learned about better managing your time so you can find a balance between a personal life and a business life? So I create a loose schedule. Okay. I've learned that tight schedules for me don't work. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I'm a single, I'm a mom. I, you know, I have a teenager and a tween and a dog that thinks she's human. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned that tight schedules don't work for me, but I do have loose schedules. So I know that I'm going to do certain things, or at least I try to do certain things at certain times. So I know that I will respond to emails at a certain time of the day. I know that I will get on social media at a certain time of the day. I know when I, you know, I just know when I'm going to edit my photos and I really try to stick to that as much as I can. But the way that works for me is also knowing how to say no to things that take me away from my time. That's not serving me. <laughs> that's not really serving me. <laughs> yeah. And that's a great point. Um, and, and I think yes. that, that's a great way to actually frame the idea of delegation, which I'm going to ask you about here in just mm -hmm. a second. But when it comes to outsourcing or delegation, a lot of times photographers will, um, they might pose the question, is this something that I enjoy or not? And there are a lot of things mm -hmm. that we enjoy, actually, that don't necessarily serve us. So I don't think that's the best question. Um, I, I think looking at it from the standpoint of does this serve me and my personal goals? And then, of course, those personal goals naturally should affect my business goals. Mm -hmm. Does this activity serve those goals? And that's the that's the more intelligent question to ask. And, and I really love that. Um, so that's a great suggestion. And you talked about a loose schedule. I would agree with you on this, too. I have a, a rough structure um, that I'd like to shoot for in my day to day. But I also feel micromanaged if I'm like, you know, putting a schedule together. It's like a 15 minute increments. Yes. Like oh, the, my gosh. Right. And, and, and we're I mean, we're our own bosses. And that, that's kind of the whole idea behind being a business owner is we get to be our own boss and decide our own schedule. Yes. So if we're kind of defeating the purpose, if we're being too rigid about it. Exactly. And I, you know, and I tried it and it just it drives me crazy. It feels like a boss, like you said, micromanaging me. Except I'm the boss and I have to yell at myself. <laughs> That's too funny. Will you, will you just kind of sum up again what you said in that loose schedule, that just the kind of loose segments in your day? You mentioned editing. What are the, some of the other segments? Okay, so definitely self-care. Okay. <laughs> I know that's not, if people don't think that's really business related, but oh, 100 I hundred percent like is. Yes, I feel like it's definitely business related. We get stressed out, you know, even if we're still editing our own photos, a lot of us outsource some of our work and still edit some of it yeah. and then or others outsource all of it. I haven't outsourced mine yet. We'll get to that, I guess. But for me, I get frustrated with things quickly or I may not be able to or I may get behind my schedule. So I take time to meditate mm. and practice self-care, even if it's five minutes. So I will force myself to take a, a break to meditate. I do my editing. I have, I save time for education. 
I think that's really important. As as photographers, we're constantly growing. Things are constantly changing, especially when it comes to social media and how we communicate with our clients. So I definitely also try to take time to educate myself, if not every day, a few times a week. That's really great, though. And and, and I mean, mm-hmm. you're, you're, it's ultimately an effort at bettering yourself personally, meditation, bettering yourself personally mm-hmm. and, and professionally with education. I think it's important. Um, I found even in the recent weeks, as my schedule has changed with you know being at home more, dealing with the coronavirus, there is mm-hmm. there is a I, I, well I guess just to put it simply, I used to to get up at say six o'clock or so six fifteen or so in the morning. Mm-hmm. My kids are off to school, and then I'd head to the gym and I'd start the day with a really great workout. Well, yes, my kids are no longer going to school. The gym is shut down, and yes, very simply, my schedule has changed, and I've found a, a lack of or a, a difference in exhilaration, I guess, levels, yes. energy levels going into work as my schedule has changed. And so I think there's something to be said for, I mean, self-care sounds again, kind of a cliche because you hear it a lot in the industry mm-hmm. these days, but there's some significance to it and making sure that you're taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, I think that's really important and it really can make a big difference in our effectiveness as a business owner. So I, I think it's, Absolutely. I think it's great. You're doing that. And can, I want to talk to that a little bit too, if you don't mind, Please. you were talking about your schedule being off because of you know, everything that's going on right now with the coronavirus. So I agree. My schedule got thrown completely off when I first started. uh, When I first started my self-isolation, I was like, okay, I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I did for a little bit. I I would get up, I read, I do a little bit of, I do yoga. I, you know, I had this schedule. It wasn't necessarily a rigid schedule, but it was a schedule. And I I had my day jam packed. (laughs) And I did that for about a week or two. And I was like, wait a minute, I can't maintain this. My kids are not having this either. (laughs) And my dog is looking at us like, what are y'all doing? (laughs) I, and so I realized that I actually was starting to, I was setting myself up to burnout. And I always talk about burnout and how to avoid burnout and how to find yourself after burnout. And so because of that, I realized that I was setting myself up for that burnout. And I had to just stop everything. And I did. I stopped everything. My schedule got completely thrown off. I was staying up all night and sleeping late in the day. And so I did that for a few days. And then I was like, wait a minute. Okay, I can find balance here. And so I did find my balance. I would now I wake up at, you know, around six or seven o'clock in the morning. I'll just take the time to enjoy laying in bed, not having to actually get up and do anything enjoy my kids not having to get up (laughs) super early um, and get them ready for school. And I can kind of just breathe and be thankful, read a book, have, I don't drink, I don't really drink coffee anymore, drink tea, maybe water, whatever, and then start my day. So I've had to actually find my new normal. And, and the good thing about that is that I want to take that into my life after the world opens back up, <laughs> after we get back to normal, because I realized this, like doing all of these things brings me the type of peace that I didn't necessarily have before. And I think if we can all do that, that like, if we don't learn any other lesson from what's going on right now, it's taking the time to slow down a little bit so that we can better serve our customers, our, our, our clients. I I can't I can't really add anything to that. It's beautifully summed up, and I, and I really appreciate you you sharing your experience. I think it's a great reminder for for yes. all of us. You talked about burnout, and and that's very much related to my next question, which has to do with outsourcing or delegation. It's one of the ways yes. that we can minimize the possibility of that. What's been your experience with this idea? So I have been really rolling this around in my head. I've always done everything, and that causes, I mean, it caused me to burn out. When I first burned out, I was living in Hawaii. I was working in mortgage banking full-time mm. and running a full-time photography business and a full-time mom, <laughs> single mom, like newly divorced single mom. Wow. And it was difficult. And I mean, I would work, you know, 10, 12 hour days on my, you know, in mortgage banking and then come home and, and work five or six more hours in photography And then on the weekends, I was photographing weddings and sessions, you know, and so I didn't have any days off, really. And I realized it was because I was doing everything. 
And so I've learned to, and I didn't have a, a process either. So I've learned to streamline my process. And now I'm thinking, you know, I realize people who are on the next level are absolutely delegating and they're absolutely outsourcing. So I'm looking to see where I can outsource. My first thing that I do want to outsource will be my edits. So I'll be talking to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here um, and available whenever you'd like. <laughs> yes. But that's going to be, I think that's what I want my first thing to be just because once I find, like once I get my my style matched, it's just something that I won't have to worry about, even though I love editing. And then, you know, something that I've really been considering doing, you know, I was talking about education. We always tend to want to do our um, marketing ourselves, do our, you know, our, our online marketing. I'm looking at maybe delegating that as well. Wow. How would you do that? Are you working with a marketing firm or somebody to handle social media? I Yes, I'm looking at having someone handle my social media. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and you know, you, you made you made mention of the fact that you enjoy editing. And to our earlier conversation, it's yeah. it, it, there's nothing wrong with enjoying that or anything else that we do. In fact, I think it's great that, that we enjoy it. I, mm -hmm. in fact, enjoy editing, despite the fact that I started a company, Photographer's Edit, 12 years ago, um, because I was so overwhelmed with my editing. In yes. general, I enjoy editing editing. But the question, of course, yes. comes back to does it best serve our personal goals? Exactly. And that's where exactly. we have to kind of make some decisions. So yeah, exactly. sh shout out to Photographer's Edit for, for anybody who's listening in who's not familiar. Um, you can go to photographersedit.com and, and check out more information about um, our editing services there. And, you know, ultimately, the book of podcasts is about helping photographers build sustainable businesses. Delegation yes. and outsourcing is is a very big part of that. So thanks for sharing your thoughts on that, Tony. And, and Yeah, it is. And I think that a lot of photographers were, you know, when it comes to editing, they worry that it's cheating. <laughs> They're like, I love it. It's, it. This is my work and this is my baby. And if I outsource it, it's cheating. It's not cheating. Take care of yourself. <laughs> Well, and then, of course, it naturally begs the question, were all the photographers prior to 2001 or so cheating as photographers because they were sending their, right. their film off to the labs? Um, yeah, exactly. it's, it's funny what we exactly. kind of make up in our head, the excuses that we make up. Yes, know? I agree. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you sharing your perspective on that. Talk to me about inspiration. Um, and, and this is yet another, it's funny, we're talking about a lot of phrases or words today that, that feel kind of cliche because we hear them a lot in our industry. But uh -huh. um, I think there's something to be said for a certain amount of inspiration. And I'm curious if you find inspiration somewhere outside of photography, outside of photographers' Instagram accounts and this type of thing, what would that be? Yes. So truth be told, I don't really follow photographers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I... All of my friends in the industry, I found them through community and I didn't even look at their work until after the fact. So there are some people that I was friends with that I actually built friendships with. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, that's you. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't follow. I try not to follow photographers because we kind of get in a bubble <laughs> and we start kind of producing the same work over and over again. 100%. Um, but I watch, I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I do watch TV and when I do watch movies, I definitely look at the way that it's photographed or the way that it's shot. I look at the cinematography. I love just a few shows that I watch that really speak to me and the way that I've been growing in the way that I shoot. Um, one of them is the TV show Queen Sugar. I love the way she frames each scene. Each scene is a photograph. Like e the way that she frames it, every movement that people make is a photograph. And the way that she shoots low and just all of that, it really makes me stop and think about the way that I see the world. And another one is the TV show Insecure. Even though I don't really watch Insecure anymore, I love the way that they light everyone in the show, huh. even in low light. So I look at things like that. Um, the most, I can't remember the movie. It's the, the Korean movie that just like swept the award ceremonies. I mean, all of the award shows. I watched that in theaters. Just that movie was so beautifully made. Just watching the way every single movement and every single scene was also a photograph. So I'm very inspired by movies and TV shows. Um, and then I'll just go and sit and people watch. And so I'm inspired by watching the way that people move and communicate with each other. 
I, my favorite place to do that is in the airport. Like there's so many people yes! walking through. Oh my gosh. Oh, and I, and that's one of the reasons I love traveling so much is just the opportunity yes. to be in an airport. And one of the reasons yes. I love that is just to be able to people watch. I think it's brilliant. You, you mentioned that that movie as well. Is that Parasite? Parasite. Yes. That's the movie Parasite. Yeah, my, my kids and I were just talking last night about movies on that, that we needed to put on our watch list or that were on our watch list. And that was one of them came up. I still haven't seen it. And that's on my watch oh list. Oh, my now, gosh. So. When you watch it, you have to you have to hit me up and tell me what you thought of it. OK. It's, first of all, the movie is a really amazing movie. And I think it's great for your kids because it'll make them think about the way that we move through the world. and It'll make them think about social class. But for you as an artist, <laughs> it's going to just when you see it, you're just going to be visually stimulated. So I can't wait. Oh, I'm looking forward to it for, for both those reasons. I think it, I think it's going to be mm-hmm. really interesting based on the, mm-hmm. the incredible reviews that I've heard. Yes, definitely worth it. And I totally agree about the airport. You know, you see people and me as a person who photographs couples and I photograph women intimately. I love watching people say hello and goodbye. Just the emotion in that. And you get that at an airport. Yeah, a hundred percent. Especially if you stay at the like, the, I think about the Atlanta airport, and there's this really cool place where yeah. everybody kind of hangs out around this escalator, and this long yes. escalator it comes up to the top, and and the people that are coming home and they're traveling to see family, or maybe they're coming back from overseas or whatever the case, yes. And everybody's standing in line there, and then that person comes up over the top of the escalator, you know, and and, and they they walk out and and that family member or those friends or whoever it is kind of step out of line and go give them a big yes. hug. And it's so exciting to watch. Yes. The expression and the sad part is, you know, watching them leave, hmm. watching them say goodbye. It's the exact same for me. Wow. Wow. Well, I, I think it's a great encouragement for all of our listeners to look for inspiration outside of mm-hmm. that little Instagram app on your phone. It's mm-hmm. time to, to move beyond that and look elsewhere because there's a lot to be learned and found elsewhere. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate Absolutely. you showing that perspective. Oh, and one more. Th- I do want to say one more thing. I'm yeah. sorry. One more. And so I know you just said getting away from Instagram. There is one thing that I do th- um, follow on Instagram, and okay. those are painters and, and people who draw like illustrators. I, because I look at, I love looking at old paintings. So I'll pull up a book and just study, study how they posed um, sculptures, like how they sculpted in, you know, in the past and how they would pose people for that. And so that also speaks to the way that people draw and paint today. So a lot of my self portraits have been inspired by paintings. And I realize a lot of them don't really understand how the body moves because, you know, my body doesn't move that way. (laughs) (laughs) But I still draw inspiration from that, too. So I, when I do follow things on Instagram, because, you know, people are still going to use it, even though we tell them, look outside of that. If you are going to use it, I do say, look up illustrators, look up artists, painters, because the way they see the world is a little bit, uh, a little bit too completely different from how we see the world. Oh, yeah. In many cases, drastically different. Mm-hmm. So you're right. I think the perspective is good. Yes, because they study, they study study the body and they study body movements. My Mm. daughter is an artist. And one of the things that she's always asking me for are those little modeling, wooden modeling things. And she'll sit there and just play with it and move the body and she'll watch it and then she'll draw from it. Like they study the body. And so as photographers, a lot of, a, a lot of what will elevate our work a lot of times outside of the way that we shoot and the way that we edit is how we actually pose our clients. And you can't be a a better poser if you aren't actually studying how the body moves. So interesting. Yeah. Looking at line and form um, Mm -hmm. through the perspective of an artist. That's interesting. And yeah, by the way, I I don't want to suggest that people don't spend time on Instagram. I know we're going to my, all I was getting at is just that, (laughs) that we do more than just that, you know, because it's easy to wake up, pull up Instagram and just start scrolling. And that's kind of our, our so-called um, I guess reference point, and and you make such a great point. It, it's, I mean, the the photography industry very obviously and kind of blatantly just copies and pastes what everybody else is doing, mm-hmm. and it's easy to do that. So I would encourage mm-hmm. everyone to look outside the industry for additional inspiration as well. Absolutely. All right. So moving from inspiration to education, let's talk about an impactful business self help book. We could even go the direction of a podcast if you'd like that you've found most impactful in the last few years. Oh man, Brene Brown, anything, anything by her. Actually, I'm going to give you two books. Perfect. (laughs) So one, 
Brene Brown and it's um, Daring Greatly. I think that's the name of it. Yes. yes Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. And the other one is by um, Simon. I always say his name wrong. Simon Sinek. Yes. Start with why. Start, start with why. Yes. I read those um, over and over again because I every time I read it, I tend to pull something um, new from it. But start with why actually helped me when I was working through overcoming burnout. I didn't know how to articulate how I needed to re um, frame my business or re like how to approach my business again, because after I burned out, like I shut my business down. <laughs> like I didn't shoot for, I didn't pick up a camera for two years. And when I picked it back up, I needed to figure out why I was doing what I was doing so that I didn't fall back into that same routine. So I know earlier I talked about um, doing everything and not delegating. Um, but the other thing was I wasn't, um, I don't feel like I had a strong reason as to why I was doing what I was doing. And I needed to figure out why I was doing what I was doing so that when things got hard, I could always go back to that reference point and say, okay, this is why I'm doing this. And this is what inspires me. But also that's not the only part of my business. No, but that's a, that's such a great point because it, what we're talking about is an idea that's bigger than us, right? Like if, if everything mm -hmm. that we did on a daily basis as a business owner was driven just by kind of somewhat trite kind of selfish desires, then, yes. then we're only going to be able to last so long. If we're, if we're fighting yes. for an idea that's bigger than us, it ultimately is focused on serving somebody else. Mm -hmm. at, at that point, we have an energy of sorts that will help sustain our business over the long haul. And I think it's really important. So I'm glad that you emphasize yes. that. We'll actually link to that book, both those books, actually, in the show notes, bookapodcast.com. These are yes. books, actually, that have come up quite a bit on the podcast. And I believe um, it. <laughs> and, and, and you can see, for those of you listening in, if you actually go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H, bookshelf.com, Haley's put together a collection of the most popular book recommendations on the podcast and you can see those there categorized as well so make sure you go check that out and um, certainly these two books I think are both part of that that uh, bookshelf so check those out for sure make sure you get a copy of those books if you get the opportunity let's let's keep going though and I want to dig into this this topic of vulnerability Tony because yeah. um, again the the conversation that we had at the cookout was particularly impactful to me you seem to have a perspective and an approach with this topic that was really interesting to me. I'd like to start, I mean, you, you talked earlier about the significance of intimate portrait photography. Will you give a little bit more context to that? I know you, you do a, a type of boudoir photography. You're also photographing couples. Is there anything else that you add mm -hmm. to that mix? Um, not really at this point. <laughs> I mean, I do photograph weddings. So I used to be a wedding photographer and I stopped just because weddings were overwhelming to me, but I do shoot with the collective and I'm getting back into elopements because elopements make me happy. But I also approach that from an intimate standpoint. And so you are asking about how I view intimate lifestyle photography. So I don't call boudoir. Well, I don't shoot boudoir anymore. Okay. I like to say that I don't. I do, but I kind of don't. <laughs> I just approach it from a different perspective because I feel like the way that we view boudoir is from a, a heavy male gaze. Mm. And so there's really not much intimacy there. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I don't say that to knock it. It's just not my thing. Just because of the way that I view black women and the way that I view our bodies, I don't want to be someone who's I don't want to be the person who's always pushing, you know, a hypersexual agenda on anyone if that's not who they are. And I don't even think that's really fair to say for me either. I just feel like a lot of women are not hypersexual. Or they don't want to be seen as hypersexual, but they want to connect with themselves in a very sensual way. And so when I photograph people intimately, my goal is to connect with them at where they are in that moment with who they are. And it may not be hypersexual or it may not be sexual at all. They may, you know, they may really like books <laughs> and they just want to sit down and read. And so I'll capture them sitting down reading in an oversized sweater. But the conversations that we have during the photo shoot will make it intimate because of the connection that we're making and because of the expression that they give. 
So that's how I view photographing people intimately. And even with couples, the conversation that I have with them during the session um, and the way that I allow them to love on each other shows it shows them in a very intimate way. Now, can it get sexual? Yes, it can. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as that's what they're comfortable with and that's what they want to express. Yeah. And, and I'm glad, I mean, there's so many different directions we could go in this. I, I'm glad that you're bringing all of this up. First of all, I'm glad that you're, that you're emphasizing the simple reality, which is that there's nothing wrong with sex or sexualization. Right. If, if there is an agreement that that's where they want to go with, with those mm-hmm. photographs. Um, mm-hmm. But what I'd, I'd really love for you to do though, is to highlight the difference though, between sexualization and or sex, sexuality and sensuality in the context of photographs. Because I, I, you started to kind of go there. You were talking about, for example, photographing a woman who, who likes to read in really comfortable clothing, yes. and that might involve a lack of clothing. That has nothing to do with trying to look sexy. It's just intimate right. because it's an insight into her life in that moment and how she might live day to day. So can you kind of right. create that distinction, a further distinction between sexuality and sensuality? I think you really nailed it when you said what you just said. For me, so I typically don't photograph women in lingerie. When women wear lingerie, they get in a certain mindset. We imitate what we see and what we've grown up on. So when we, you know, when I think of lingerie, I think of the movie True Lies and Jamie Lee Curtis doing a strip tease for (laughs) Arnold Schwarzenegger, not realizing it's her husband. You know, like that's what I think about. And so, and that scene is even telling to what we're talking about because she was a suburban mom. She wasn't the, you know, the sexy person who always wore lingerie, which is why he enjoyed what was going on. And he kind of laughed because she was emulating what she thought was sexy. And then what happened? Didn't she like fall off the bedpost or something like that? I don't know. So in my mind, that's how I see the difference between sexuality and sensuality. Like she fell and it was funny and it was a moment. And so even during like when I'm photographing women, they come to me with that mindset and they're, you know, well, they used to before I started setting the expectation, they would come in with that mindset like, oh, I have to be sexy like this. And I have to pretend that I'm doing this and touch myself this way and give you this facial expression. And even still, when they come in, they do that because they don't, that's what they know. Mm -hmm. And I'll take a picture of that. And then we'll talk a little bit. I'll redirect them and say, okay, so instead of putting your hand here on your hip and and sticking your, sticking your bottom out this way, how about you move your hand here and, and relax your fingers and put it like behind your neck and just kind of rub on your neck and love on yourself and just enjoy the moment and just think about how lovely your skin feels and how, how, you know, amazing you feel today or how nervous you are in this moment because you're doing this. And we're talking and I make them laugh and they relax and I photograph that and they're connecting with themselves and having a really sensual moment. And then I show them the difference between the two images and they're like, oh my gosh, I understand what you mean now. What? Is that me? (laughs) And they're like, okay, I get it. I don't have to be a video vixen. I can be myself. And they're like, oh, and then they'll say, oh my gosh, I thought this was going to be so much harder. And then I let them know, oh, it's going to get hard because these poses are going to hurt. And that's why I had to work out before (laughs) out (laughs) or stretch rather. But I think that's the difference between that sexuality and sensuality. It's what you think is sexy versus what you how you naturally move because i believe every person is sexy in their own way it's just bringing that out of them well and and to our earlier conversation there it's it's almost hilarious how much kind of copying and pasting goes on right there yes. is this there's this idea that this particular look shaping your face in this way, shaping your body yes. in this way, like this is the default sexy. And so in order to, to take a sexy picture, that's where you have to go. Um, and then everybody ends up just kind of looking the same and hilariously at the same time, probably looking quite awkward for many people because that most people yes. don't pose that way. They don't look that way normally. Um, so, so I love that you're going the direction of helping them look more comfortable in themselves yes. and in a more natural setting. And, Absolutely. Um, and, and I think that's something we can all kind of take a, an example from. But how does this, and maybe this goes without saying, maybe it's kind of an obvious question, but just to kind of introduce our conversation, how does vulnerability relate to photographing intimate portraits like this? Oh, wow. I was actually just going to bring that up too. I'm glad you said it. So I'm just going to say this. It's really funny too, because 
women cry during these sessions <laughs> and not just because of the conversations that we have, but seeing themselves in this way because they're showing a part of themselves that they don't typically show anyone else. You know, when we're imitating things, we're, we're copying it because we know that's what people expect. We know like that's the expectation that's set. And we know, okay, I told them I'm taking, uh, I'm doing a boudoir shoot. So they're going to expect me if they know what that is. Or once I explain that to them and say, I'm taking pictures in my lingerie or I'm taking pictures this way, they're going to expect this sexy, whatever it is that, you know, that people expect from it. Um, but then they see themselves softened and they're like, oh my gosh, that's me. I can't believe it's me. And then they cry and they're like, I don't, I didn't know I could look like that. And that's how the people in their inner circle may see them. We put up, everyone puts up a wall. You know, we have our representative that we present to the world. And I feel like it's even more so for people of color. And since I work with Black people, I'm just going to always reference Black people. Sure. Um, but I do believe it's um, something that all people of color have to deal with. But in this society, but specifically since that's, that's who I shoot, Black people, we have to present ourselves in a certain way so that we don't present as stereotypes. You know, I told you I worked in mortgage banking back in Hawaii. And so the biggest stereotype for me was whenever I'd show emotion, I'd be, an angry, I'd be seen as an angry Black woman. And people would always ask me, are you angry? And I'm like, no, I'm not angry. It's just that we're having a conversation at like a professional conversation. And I'm letting you know this, this and this is not correct. And we need to fix this so that we can make our goals. That's not me being angry. That's just me saying that we need to correct this. And so because of that, a lot of us have to change the way that we talk, change the way that we communicate, change our facial expressions, wow. change our body language. And so we're not able to be vulnerable and just be ourselves because we're always on. And so when I get behind my camera and get them in front of my camera, my goal is to break down all of those walls. And so to me, being able to break those walls down is being vulnerable. And it's difficult being vulnerable because you don't want to be judged, you know, that's our biggest fear. Like a lot of people's biggest fear, it's being judged, having other people tell us what they think of us <laughs> and it not be what we want to hear <laughs> yeah. or it not be what we're trying to present. And so being able to just lower those defenses and allow a person to exhale and be themselves is like just a huge form of vulnerability. And that totally makes sense. You described that so beautifully. And, and that Thank naturally you. leads me to the next question though. Which is, I mean, you're, you're talking about very deep rooted, uh, wow, I mean, a, a, a deep, very deep rooted sense of insecurity and, mm -hmm. and, and questions about what, what is okay to, to show to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially to somebody with a, a, a camera in hand, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. already apprehensive being yourself in front of somebody, but then somebody has a camera, they're going to be photographing you. That just takes it to the next level. You, you have to work through a lot of, a history, just for lack of a better yes. word, the words aren't coming to my mind right now. But and and so in order to do that, and in a relatively short amount of time, I know that before we started recording, you mentioned a couple of things that you do with regards to communication, that it leading up to and then during the session that encourages this kind of vulnerability. Can you break those down mm -hmm. for us? Yes. So it all goes back to communication. I, I mentioned it earlier, um, setting the expectation and communicating in a timely um, fashion. All of that matters. And so it goes back to this communication. So I start the communication from the very beginning. No one can book me until we talk. <laughs> Preferably, we're going to sit down and have coffee and talk or tea or, you know, a beer wine, whatever. I'll Preferably, take the wine. I like, <laughs> yes, to the wine. Yes, I take it all. <laughs> I drink it all. So, you know, preferably I like to sit down that way so that we can meet face to face. But I will say most of my, most of my clients have met me before or they've met or they've seen me on social media. And so they have a feel, a feel for who I am, but I'm a relationship builder. So with communication, I want to start building that relationship by talking to them, letting them know who I am, being being vulnerable in front of them. Like my whole thing, I try to stay away from words like authentic and, and things like that. But I try to be as authentic as I can be to them from the very beginning. 
so that they can feel comfortable with me. A lot of people will say to me, oh my gosh, Tony, you're just so open. And, and I, you just make me, you just make me want to be open as well. Hmm. And so my openness, uh, I try to let my openness allow other people to be open. So communication up front from the very beginning. And then I ask questions that are very specific to them just in conversation. I'm a question asker. I ask why, 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 why all the time. (laughs) And my kids are the same. So I have to be very creative and frame my questions in a way to where I'm I'm not just saying why all the time, but I'm asking um, open-ended questions to get them to talk to me. And then I'm answering questions as well. So if I ask them a question, typically I may answer it for myself just so they can feel like they know me as well. Dallas Logan, he's a photographer out in LA right now. He said something. He has the he he has a book and he teaches a workshop called Light is Light. And People always ask him, how do you connect with your clients? And something he said has always stuck with me. He said, I fall in love with the person that I'm photographing in that moment, even if it's just for that moment. And so I try to do that from the very beginning. I try to connect with them and become their friend. I'm like, hey, girl, I'm, we're friends. We're friends now. <laughs> even if that friendship doesn't typically last afterwards, like I'm always open afterwards. But in that, I open myself up so that they can feel comfortable and vulnerable with me. And then we're talking and then we get to the photo session. Um, and after I've already asked questions, very specific, and they're typically not the same questions in the very beginning. I mean, I have a few that I may ask that are the same, of course, questions like, what are you looking for? What type of, what do you, what do you want to convey in your session? Things like that. But by the time I get to the actual photo shoot, they're, they have some comfort with me. And so we're girlfriends, like we're friends now <laughs> and I'm talking to them as such. What are those quite like you, you talked about how you answer the question for yourself before Um, they even answer just to kind of exemplify how to go about that. What does that sound like? Can you give an example of a question and what that would sound like in conversation? Okay. So say I'm talking to them and I ask them, um, well, I'm asking questions about their kids. I'm asking questions about their career. I'm asking questions about the things that they like, things that they dislike. I'm asking about their body, you know, things that they may be comfortable with and maybe not so comfortable with, with their bodies. And, you know, most women will say, oh, I'm not comfortable with my stomach or my arms. And I'd be like, girl, I completely understand that after, you know, after having two kids and, you know, a divorce and my weight has gone up and down, I'm not always happy with my stomach. But I, you know, I still love my stomach and I still look in the mirror and talk to myself and tell myself that I'm beautiful. And like, I'll say something like that. And I'll say, but I completely understand if you are not there, because I remember when I wasn't there, something like that. And I open the conversation up and then they're like, oh my gosh, you get it. <laughs> love that. Yeah. And and we connect over something as simple as that. But I'm also making a mental note in my head that, oh, she's not comfortable with her stomach. So during the session, when I see that I pose her a certain way and she's getting stiff, I can reassure her, you look amazing. Your stomach looks amazing, girl. Like th- you're going to love this pose. And I keep that in mind. And I'm never trying to cover up their stomachs or what or whatever they dislike. But I'm trying to photograph it in a way that will show them that it's still beautiful. And then are you, you mentioned before we started recording that you're giving them, I guess, suggestions as to, to how they pose. I, I like the conversation yes. to encourage that that feeling of intimacy and encourage the willingness yes. to be vulnerable. Um, but then are you kind of giving them cues as far as the posing is concerned? Absolutely. So I use this book. There's a book series. Uh, they're in several different volumes, but they're called Superfeel. And that's the website as well, Superfeel. And so they these books have prompts and they start the conversation when you may feel like you don't know what to say. <laughs> I laugh because people who are introverts are like, oh, this book is perfect for me. It's the the introvert's way to start a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's just really good because I think these books are really good because in the moment you may draw a blank and you may not know where to go, but these books have prompts that you can, that you can add, uh, that you can give them, um, to get a certain emotion. So, you know, those, I remember back in the day, we do it this way. I say back in the day, like I'm so old, 
but <laughs> you know, like maybe nine, eight or nine years ago when I first started, we'd say something like, you know, nibble on their ear, tell them, tell, you know, we tell, tell the guy away from the woman, like when I wink at you or when I clear my throat <laughs> i want you to walk up behind her and, yeah. and wrap your arms around her waist and, and say something in her ear like tell her a funny joke or something like that those are really amazing prompts and i still use those but these books break them down so that you're not saying the same thing over and over again well i'm actually on the the superfeel site um you mentioned that and by the way for everybody listening in if you go to superfeel.com just like it sounds um, mm-hmm. their, their position, their brand position actually is very simply, we help photographers evoke all the feels and, yep, um, exactly. and then you can buy these, what looks like little booklets with the prompts built in, uh, which mm-hmm. is really kind of brilliant. I actually want to get some myself. Yes, you totally should. So for me, I am really silly. So during a photo shoot, even my intimate lifestyle photo shoots in my boudoir photo shoots people are like I can't believe we got these sexy pictures because we were laughing the entire time (laughs) I'm super super duper silly but I know how to say something to bring out an emotion but you know I'm not always having the best day so I can always go back to these books and (laughs) I can always go back to what I read or pull something up and be like okay this is what I need to do I typically go through, go into the session knowing what I want to get from them because we've talked ahead of time. So I, I have a feel of who they are and where I want to go. So I typically have prompts in my head that I want to go with that I may have written down that I'll, you know, guide them with. But well, yeah, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing series for people who may not feel comfortable doing that or don't quite know how to do that yet. I love that. We're going to link to that in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. Mm-hmm. And, and seriously, I may have to go download or purchase whatever I need to do to get a hold of some of that because yes, um, I, I think yes. it's, it's great to have those in the back of our minds anytime we're, we're taking a photograph. If, Like you said, if, if in the moment we kind of run out of ideas, it's always great mm-hmm. to have something that we can pull from. So that's a really great Absolutely. recommendation. And feelings, pulling feelings out of people is how you get vulnerability. You make them feel something and they give you that laugh or they may, you may say something and they look up at you and they give you this sultry look and it's like, Oh, that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That's yeah. how you get the vulnerability. So. <laughs> and it's so funny that you respond that way. Cause that's, that's exactly me Tony. I'm like, Oh my word. Yes. That looks so good. You got it. <laughs> so we all do it. <laughs> Which by the way, is a good reminder just to, I want to throw this in here. It's we need to encourage our subjects, yes. our clients as they're being photographed, if we see something that we like, um, I mean, it it starts with genuinely being interested in them. And so that the, yes. com- the compliments then come from a genuine place. Get excited yes. for them when they when they Absolutely. they show something off that looks really great. Let them know it's really important. And, and that will help them relax as well. So I, I think that's a great Absolutely. reminder. Absolutely. I have been doing um, since I'm not shooting, even when I'm in Texas, we're opening back up on May 1st. I will not be (laughs) Tony black will not be photographing people, but I have been doing webcam and iPhone sessions and the quality of the images are not the best, but it's not about the photos. It's about the experience. And that's why people are booking me. You know, I book several a week and when I don't even put, like, I'm not even thinking about it. And then I get someone book me. Um, The interesting thing about it is the experience. And even in on my on my page where I'm talking about it, where you can actually purchase my session, I talk about the experience. It's like, you know, you're going to be like people call me like the ultimate hype person. (laughs) Like one of my friends called me the other night just because she had some good news. And she was like, I need somebody to celebrate with. Who am I going to celebrate with? Tony Black. So I bring that energy to my sessions and I'm constantly encouraging them. That's huge. Even if, yeah, even if they do something, and, and this is really important too, even if they do a pose that I don't like, even if they, even if they make a facial expression that's not flattering, I will not say it and I will keep the best poker face. And I'm not going to be like, oh girl, we, not, we can't do that. I'm not <laughs> going to say that. I'll be like, okay, beautiful, but let's try this. Right. And then I'll redirect them. But I bring that energy. Like I go from, oh my God, girl, that is like, I just went mm, to like just jumping up and down excited, yep. you know? And then when I do that and 
I, the way that I inflict, I do it on purpose. Well, I don't always do it on purpose, (laughs) but I do it in a way to where I'm looking for that response after I hype them, because that's going to give a really, really vulnerable and really genuine facial expression and body movement as well. And some of those um, images after are better than the image that I just hyped up. (laughs) <laughs> well, but it's so, it's so true. Drink. Like we have to remember that that most people don't get that kind of affirmation on a daily yes. or even weekly basis from anybody. Unfortunately, close close to yes. them. So that somebody that that is first of all asking them to be vulnerable in front of the camera is, is willing mm-hmm. to bring that kind of energy, a genuine interest, genuine compliments, and in a genuine excitement about what they're doing in front of the camera. It's just going to make such a big impact. Um, it does. And, and, and if, for those of you listening, and if you don't take anything away from this conversation today, you just take that. It's going to make a drastic, mm-hmm. drastic difference in the sessions that you photograph and wedding sessions, whatever it might be. If you bring that energy, I think it's really, really important. But I wanted, Tony, as we're closing out our conversation today, I want to get back to something that you said earlier, uh, which I think is really, really important. Um, you mentioned the comment that you get, Tony, you're so open. And uh, yes. in our industry, and this is one of the things that I was really taken by in our conversation at the cookout um, a number of months ago, we were talking about vulnerability as it relates to the photography industry. Mm-hmm. And one of the most popular things to say right now is I'm an introvert. And so na- <laughs> na- naturally, photographers who are introverted, the idea of being open, of showing emotion, of being excited, and ultimately creating the experience that we're talking about here they're they're saying that they can't do that naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, I mm-hmm. I've shared my my kind of thought process or belief system with regards to calling ourselves or labeling ourselves introverted extrovert. I think it's ultimately mm-hmm. a a word that represents behavioral patterns that we have the ability to step beyond. But I'd love for you to just comment on this as we close because what you're recommending photographers do is not something that many feel comfortable with because they've kind of stuck themselves in this box called introversion. Right. So I don't consider myself an introvert. I mean, I'm an ambivert. I'm more extroverted. People are like, oh, you're such an extrovert. Um, But I have my moments where I just like to retreat within myself. Um, But I totally agree that it's a behavioral thing. Um, it's It's a behavioral pattern. I've actually watched some of my friends who are super duper shy, just really transform over the past six months because they made the decision to be more open for their clients. That's it. So they're yep. more open on social media and they're more open in their sessions. And then afterwards they kind of retreat back into themselves, but they've made a they've they've made the decision to be more outwardly open. And it's difficult. I think it goes back to some people genuinely just don't like to be bothered or they genuinely just don't like the energy. And that's fine. I get that. Because I go through my moments where I just don't want to be bothered with people. I don't want to talk. I just don't want to have that conversation. But when it comes to relating to people, like I have to be able to share myself in order for someone to share back with me. A person is not going to open up to you if they don't trust you and if they don't know you. And if you're not open with them, then they're not going to trust you and they're not going to know you. (laughs) And they're going to form their own opinions of you. So I think people worry a lot about what people think of them. And I think that they use that as the default to say, oh, I'm an introvert. I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. When really it may just be driven by the fear of judgment. Right. Which, uh, you know, I mean, insecurity, again, that's insecurity yes. represents a a psychological development over time through personal experience. And it's yes. a very real thing. I don't want to minimize the feeling of introversion. I've experienced it on a very deep level quite, quite a bit, actually, over the years. I've yes. certainly had my own insecurities. I understand these things. But what I want to encourage mm-hmm. everybody with is the very thing that you just pointed out a second ago, the word that you used was decision. You said photographers mm-hmm. that you know made the decision to make a change in their behavior. Um, Mm -hmm. And and so I think, first of all, it's important to note that we can make a choice to step beyond our kind of natural comfort zone. The other thing that I want to encourage photographers to do is to not oversimplify themselves, 
by just giving themselves a label and then leaving it at that. The reality is, in many, if not most cases, you can look at you know certain insecurities that we have about behaving a certain way. Oh, you know, it, it's crazy to to be out loud and excited and and jump up and down and whatever. But, uh-huh. but if you actually take a step back, or if that individual takes a step back and they look at the way that they were brought up, for example. Um, uh-huh. maybe, maybe their dad who they had so much respect for and wanted to please and make happy their dad thought that that silly behavior was ridiculous and stupid. And so they, yes. they've got that in their head and whether they thought about it or not, or it was conscious or not, that is ultimately translated to the way that they behave on a daily Absolutely. basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's just one small example, but I, I just wanted to give that example because if you as a photographer listening in are willing to just take a step back and look at where this behavioral pattern or these tendencies come from, Mm -hmm. that then enables you to the ability to do exactly what Tony was just talking about, which is to make a decision to move beyond those understanding how you can shift your behavior because it's not, you're not, introversion does not equal you. That's just a behavioral pattern. You can choose to shift it. Absolutely. And then adding to what you said about your learned behavior and shifting, because I 100% agree with that. And that goes for so many other um, things in our lives as well, our behaviors and why we do the things that we do, why we communicate the way that we communicate. But even bringing that forward, um, being that we live on social media, I feel like a lot of it is a hot take. (laughs) A lot of what we believe is introversion is just a hot take. And we use those hot takes as excuses <laughs> to to stay comfortable. It's just the thing to the thing to say in the moment. It is. It's the thing to say in the moment. You're like, oh, I don't, you know, I can't, I can't communicate with my clients that way because I don't know how. I'm intro. It's because I'm introverted. And it's like, okay, I get it. You may very well be introverted. But that's not the reason why you don't know how to communicate with your clients. You're using that as a hot take, as an excuse, because we feel like introversion is this this umbrella of what it is. And yeah. that's really not what it is. And so if you feel like you can't communicate with your clients, bam, we just gave you something super feel. Read that <laughs> and then learn how to, you know, or read books on body language or go on YouTube, like just watch people and talk to your friends who are better at communicating and, and study how they communicate or even ask someone if you can come along on a photo session and see how they communicate with their clients. You know, we use things to, to um, excuse away things we don't know how to do. And then we just kind of sit in it. <laughs> yes. That's so true. It's so true. So we can't use these hot takes to like claiming introversion to sit in it and you know and not move to the next level because you could be really stifling your growth oh I, you beautifully summed it up i'm not going to even try to add anything more to it this has been <laughs> this has been a really great conversation tony and and i have to end yes. it with the same thing that i began the conversation with which is that your energy is wonderful and it's a beautiful Thank beautiful you. example of exactly what it is that you're recommending photographers do and and those of you listening in especially those who feel like they're introverted again not judging you there's nothing wrong with that feeling But just think about how you felt listening to this conversation versus maybe a different podcast that you listened to where it was kind of monotone and the Mm -hmm. the people involved were not really into it. There's just a different feeling that you get from engaging with or listening to somebody that brings excitement to a Mm -hmm. conversation. Think about that with regards to how you approach your next session. Mm -hmm. Step outside that little box and and bring that energy because it's going to translate to a really beautiful experience for your clients. Yes. And it doesn't even have to, you know, when people, when I, when people talk about my energy and how they're like, oh, I can never do that. I'm like, you don't have to have my energy. Like I'm naturally energetic. I am almost always hyped. So when I'm not, people are like, oh my gosh, girl, what's wrong? Um, But find what it is within yourself. Be, learn to be comfortable with who you are and how you communicate um, behind closed doors and find a way to bring that outward. You know, earlier we talked about me being open. I'm not as open as people think I am. (laughs) You know, my friends who know what's going on in my real life are always like, how do you let, how do you have people thinking they know exactly who you are, but you have this whole other side of you that they don't know. And I'm like, I understand the difference between keeping my business private, but still being open with people and allowing them to see a part of who I am. So I just learned to communicate with people. And it's not that I even 
don't, it's not even that I'm showing a fake side of myself. I'm showing myself. I just don't tell all my business. And people think that in order to be open, you have to be completely transparent with everything. You don't have to be. You can still keep your privacy and still allow people to know who you are. And it's okay to do that. And I always tell people, I am so goofy. I am, I'm just like the goofiest person ever. I've learned to lean into that. I used to get teased because of that. I was bullied so bad growing up. (laughs) I'm actually really good friends with one of my bullies now. We're like sisters. But um, I've learned to lean into all of those qualities that I used to be fearful of. Goes back to behavior. I would stifle who I was as a person because I was worried about what people would think of me. And so I just learned to say, forget it. I don't care what you think about me. I'm just going to be myself. I'm loud. I'm, I get excited. I cry. I scream. All of those things. I lean into that. That may not be who you are, but it's okay to just exhale your, like for yourself to just exhale and be yourself in front of your clients. They'll appreciate you for it and they'll keep coming back. <laughs> Beautiful. Tony, where can our, our listeners follow you online? We just remind us of your website and social media so our listeners yes. can, can chime in. So my website is TonyBlackMagic.com. On Facebook and Instagram, I'm also Tony Black Magic. That's Tony with an I, T-O-N-I, Black Magic. And um, here shortly, you'll also be able to find me on, I'm starting a podcast of my own. Awesome. <laughs> That's Aaron. great. Yes. Um, with Aaron Hernandez. And so we're like, we're not going to be talking about photography. I mean, we will be kind of talking about photography, but we'll really just be talking about the things that girlfriends talk about. <laughs> that's awesome. Where, so, what's it going to be yes, called? That is, um, that's called the sitch with Tony and Aaron. And so that'll be coming shortly as well. Perfect. And we'll, we'll uh, make sure to put that link in the show notes too. By the time yes. this episode is out, we should be able to do that. So um, I really appreciate you sharing that, Tony, and for just sharing with us in general today. Your your energy is contagious, and Thank and I you. hope our listeners will take that away and do something with it in their business as well. Thank you, everybody, yes. for listening in. Make sure you go to bocapodcast.com, check out the show notes for today's episode, and thanks once again, Tony. Thank you. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at bocapodcast.com. We do try to bring this show to you commercial free, so make sure to check out our sponsors, photographersedit.com and Milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. Photographer's Edit is custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and Milu is the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.